Is that we can start? Is that good? All right. Sorry, I have to turn no, over my host. Turn over my hosting <laughs> duties to Jeff is instead. Um, exactly. All right, so, so we will we'll get going. Uh, Camille, thank you for joining us. Uh, we've been doing these now. My goodness, I've lost my train of thought. I think it's like ten weeks or nine weeks in. We're having someone on every Tuesday, so we're really excited to have you got you on this week. Um, so I start with the same question every time. How are you doing with with all this going on? We got a little a little preview a moment ago from Pam. Sorry. But, uh, how are you doing right now? We are doing good. We are, I said earlier, I have learned to swim school. So I retired from swimming in 2016 um, and thought I wanted to be a public school teacher. And so I went and did that for two years. I literally got off the plane in Rio and the next day was in the classroom, um, which was really fun. And so I did that for two years and I just decided that I missed being around the water and I um, really wanted to do something a little bit different than being in the classroom all day. And so um, I bought in May of 2018, my husband and I bought um, six Learn to Swim schools. And so I have those around the Houston area. So I tell people all the time, like I have my dream job at 28 years old because it's like teaching and swimming together. And so, and it's still around people. And so it's really, really fun for me. Um, and so we're doing good. We're just trying to get those reopened. And my husband went back to work about two weeks ago. So now I like have silence at my house. <laughs> it's wonderful. Um, and so, yeah, so we're doing good. I'm jealous of the silence. I'm jealous that you're able to go back to your pools. Um, so, I, and I'm skipping around. I didn't want to go to this till the end, but so you got off the plane in Rio and went and taught right away the next day. Were you teaching in Houston? Were you teaching East Coast, Houston? No. Um, I have the best family in the world. And whenever I um, left Charlotte, when I got on the plane to go to Omaha, my um, sister and my mom and my aunt drove up and got packed up. My stuff was already mostly packed up, but they finished packing up and put it in a U-Haul and brought my car back home for me um, so that I would have all my stuff and be ready to go when I um, got done with the Olympics and all that stuff. Cause that was kind of my plan is I was gonna at least teach through December and then decide, um, you know, what I wanted to do after that, if I wanted to teach or if I wanted to keep swimming. And I just kind of felt like, you know, I was, I was ready to, to retire and, and try something different and new. And so that's kind of what I did. Um, my husband and I got married in October, right after the Olympics. Um, so we did that as well. And then, and yeah. Wow. Okay. Well then you were ready to go. Um, all right. So starting out beginning of swimming, uh, what got you in the pool? How old were you? What was the start like for you? Yes. So um, Pam and I were talking about my dad. So my dad um, was and still is a swim coach. He's been a swim coach pretty much his entire um, life since he was 18 years old. Um, and so he, my I have a twin sister. So I, if I say we a lot when I talk about my younger swimming days, it's my twin sister and I. Um, we, my mom would need a break. So she would send us to the pool with my dad. And that's how we got into swimming. Um, we'd be running around the pool acting crazy and he would be like, we need to make sure these girls know how to swim when they fall in because it's going to happen. So, um, so that's how we uh, started swimming and um, just progressed through the sport and really enjoyed it. I've never done anything else, um, which is unlike most other Olympians. Most other people have, you know, done at least one or two other sports, but um, I just never really wanted to do anything else. Um, I only ever wanted to swim. Okay. So and I did not realize that you swam for your, did you swim for your father? all the way through no i didn't okay um, there we go <laughs> yeah, we decided not to have world war three in the atmosphere <laughs> so we um we both swam for my dad until we were 10 and then he really wanted us to you know go do something else and try something else so we, we did that until we were 10 but it was really fun especially once um you know once i was in college and and my last um especially my the 2016 trials, um, it was nice for him to be on the pool deck and all that kind of stuff with me. He was like my towel boy. <laughs> he That's really cool. enjoyed it. And it was just like, it's such a special bond that the two of us have together. Um, he swam in college and stuff too. So we, the three of us, I guess, with my sister just have that cool bond. Okay. So uh, when you left your father, is it, was it Conroe? Is that what the club team was? Conroe Swim Club? Is that where you were swimming? Yeah. So I actually, we moved around like quite a bit. Um, okay. Team. So I swam at the Woodlands for a while. I swam at um, Fleet for a while, which is a big club team here in Houston. Um, I swam in Conroe for a bit. I swam in Magnolia for a bit. We kind of just moved around and coaches move around here quite a bit in Houston. There's so many swim teams. Um, and so we would either, you know, follow a coach or 
you know, go somewhere right. home or, you know, different things like that. So, okay. Um, so 2012, and if I'm wrong, please like just grab, or not 2012. I apologize. I jumped too fast. 2008, 2008. Uh, were you at trials in 08? Yes, I was. I actually was ended up being 17th at trials. So I did not get a second swim. I just missed out on it and I thought it was the end of the world. Um, but it was a really good learning experience for me. I think if it wasn't for 2008 trials, I would have been a lot more nervous in 2012. Um, I went in at least knowing, you know, the layout of the pool and Omaha and, you know, the facility and how big it was going to be and how many people were going to be in the stands and all those types of things. Cause I had seen it in 2008. I kind of knew what to expect. Um, so I think it helped me out a ton four years later. Well, and even one year later, because 2009 was World Championship Trials, wasn't it? Where all of a sudden you were you were a finalist. You were one of those one of the big wigs at the meet as a high school swimmer. Yeah. Uh huh. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> all right. So so Texas A and M. I would say what drew you to Texas A and M, but you're a Texas Texas lady, so I yeah. assume that you always loved Texas A and M. But but what was the what was the big draw to that school? Yeah, so um, my grandfather actually graduated from A&M as well, which is really cool. Um, so I looked at four schools, A&M being one of them, and now they're all actually in the SDC, which is funny. But I just knew I wanted to stay somewhere close to home. Um, I do not enjoy cold weather at all. Um, so I knew I didn't want to go anywhere too super cold. And then I also wanted to go somewhere that had – I was an education major, and so I wanted to go somewhere that um, – I knew that I had a really good education program. And so when I started looking at schools, obviously A&M is one that stuck out to me. It's an hour drive, hour and 10 minutes, you know, from where we were living. And so it was just a really easy, um, an easy choice to look into for me. And then um, as I learned more about the, the team and, and the coaches and stuff like that, I just um, could not have picked a more perfect university and a more perfect team to swim for. Um, my coach, Steve Boltman at A&M, is a very large reason um, of the success I had in the sport and then also like who I am as a person today. He is just one of the most stand-up people I've ever had the pleasure to know. Um, and he was just such a good mentor and still is. And so I'm super thankful that he gave me the opportunity to swim for him, um, you know, going in, into my freshman year. And then my sophomore year, we had an assistant coach come on, um, Tamika Jameson. And obviously she was huge within the sport of swimming. And um, so it was really cool to swim for somebody that, um, you know, was a, but she was a butterflyer. And so it was nice to just swim for somebody that had been through what I was trying to do, um, which was really cool because she still had that kind of experience and that insight and those types of things, but also had the maturity with the sport, knowing what it was going to be like after retirement and, and stuff like that. And so it was just the perfect balance between the two of them. Steve is good cop, Tanika's bad cop. And so <laughs> when they work together, it's just like the dream team. I tell them all the time. They're just such a good match. And um, Tanika's actually become like a really good friend even now, um, to, you know, now that I've retired and stuff. And so it was just, it ended up just being the perfect place. And I absolutely loved my education, the school of education that I was in. Um, and so it, it ended up working out great. Um, my sister also swam at A&M with me. Um, we when she was looking at schools she wanted to go to like a small bible college like up north somewhere and then um we decided you know on this day in october whatever it was we're gonna you know have a decision and know where we're gonna go and so on the way to practice that afternoon like after school we were driving to practice and i was like okay like today's the day on the count of three like you know tell me where you're gonna go and we decided like we were gonna be each other's you know first person that was gonna know and we both said Texas A&M and we were so excited because I thought there was no way she was going to even remote, it, it remotely have a chance in her mind. Um, but she, Steve wanted, wanted her and so we had her take a recruiting trip. And, um, and so then we called Steve and let him know that we were both going to attend A&M and we for, completely forgot to call our parents. We called our coach and all of our <laughs> friends and stuff, but we completely forgot to tell mom and dad till after some practice when Steve called my dad and was like, I'm so excited about the girls. He's like, what? <laughs> we're like oops <laughs> sorry what was, what was that like i mean I, and i don't want to jump around but what was that like swimming with your sister as younger kids swimming with your sister in high school swimming with your sister in college always being together obviously twins yeah. uh, what was that like what was that dynamic like between the two of you yeah it was it's such a it was such a cool experience we kind of swim different events like ashley really only likes distance freestyle like and when i mean like distance she doesn't even like the thousand she really 
only like smile. Um, and so, and me, I was like, oh, please don't put me in the mile. I mean, I'll do it, but I don't really want to do it. Um, and so we kind of had like that difference. I mean, she did lots of turner butterflies and 400 IMs and 500 freestyles and all that kind of stuff. But um, the mile was really her thing. Um, and so, yeah, so we kind of always just, we had definitely similarities. My parents were not um, sprinter minded people. They were like, if if we're going to pay for you to do the sport, you're going to swim longer than 30 seconds. So okay. um, we wanted to get their bang for their buck out of us in the sport. And so we were always distant swimmers. Um, but it was really fun. And it was, and being a twin in general is just such a special experience. But I think swimming in college together, um, she retired after um, 2012. So um, after our sophomore year, um, she decided to take a break and she um, didn't do anything with the team our junior year and then our senior year in my fifth year she came back as like the team manager um, which was also just she was like I don't want to pay to go to your swim meets but I'm obviously going to go so the manager right. was the perfect position <laughs> um, although I don't know why she would still want to wake up at 5 a.m. yeah get it. Um, like really, yeah exactly and now she's now she's a coach she coaches a high school team um, up in Dallas and so she says you know a lot of like what sparked her interest for coaching was when she she was a manager and, and helping out with the team at AM. So yeah, it was kind of it's kind of crazy where I'm like, I do not want to coach. Not at all. No. <laughs> all right, well, you know, you brought up you brought up the, the AM coaching staff and, and I don't want to I don't want to dismiss it, but AM, you know, when you at least back in twenty ten they were a good swimming school, but it wasn't a, a top five women's team that you've kind of seen over the course of the last you know five to seven years. Um, what is that team dynamic like? I mean, what is it like being an Aggie, being with the 12th man? At, at, what, what is that like? You know, I, you've talked about Steve, you've talked about uh, Tamika, but what about the team aspect? Yeah, I think that is also a large reason of what drew me to the university and, and to, to, to swim for A&M in general. I think that Steve does a really good job like developing a, a team culture um, that has just lasted through the years. Um, and I would even say like people talk a lot about like Bria, me, and Sarah Henry, and, and Paige Miller, and our kind of class. Um, but I would say it was really the, the group before us, um, like the Alia Adkinson, you know, the uh, Julia Wilkinson, like that, that group of girls um, that were just so fast and so phenomenal and really just, you know, set the team down and said, these are our goals, this is what we want to be. So Steve, these are the type of girls that we need to recruit and what we need to do to get there. And um, they really had the vision for where they wanted to take them and what they wanted to do um, long, you know, long term with the team. And I think they're definitely the one that kind of set us set us on our way. So it's pretty, it's it was pretty cool to kind of watch them and and now see what the team has continued to do. Okay, uh, so 2012 yeah. trials. We went in 2008. We were 17th. We just missed the second swim. 2012, now you're coming into that meet, I don't want to say the favorite, but one of the favorites to potentially make the team. What's that experience like? And talk about making your first Olympics. Yeah, so um, most other Olympians or national team members will make, um, you know, multiple na national teams throughout their career before they make their first Olympic team. So they might make a World University Games or a um, Pan Ams or a Pan Pack or a World U's, you know, something else that is a, is a national level meet um, where you're competing against the best in the world, but it's not quite the Olympic Games. It's the stuff that happens all the other three years. Um, and I, I didn't ever do that. I, my first national team was the Olympic team. Um, I just happened to drop a lot of time in January of 2012. I dropped like three and a half seconds. Um, and it just put me in, you know, first or that first or second spot. And, and so obviously going in is quite the rookie on the team. Um, it was a really cool learning experience for me. You know, I had at least the last four years, if not the last eight years before then, you know, was watching Michael, was watching, you know, Natalie, was watching Dana, you know, Reb, Sony, you know, watching all these amazing people and being like, that is so cool. Like, I want to be one of them. And then 2012 hits and I'm sitting at the dinner table with them. And I'm like, one of these is not like the others. <laughs> um, and so it was just such a cool experience for me to really sit back. I did a lot of, um, like watching and learning in 2012. Um, you know, I would watch what Michael was doing for warm up or, you know, what Reb was doing for drylands and just taking little pieces of what other, what the other, you know, swimmers and athletes were doing 
to see if that's something that I think would fit into my program long term. Is that something that I like what they're doing or do I think that could might work for me? Um, and I think that's something that really projected me and ignited my passion again for the sport leading into the next four years. Um, four years doesn't seem like a long time but when you're training at the intensity that that you are and trying to defend what you've already done um it's it feels like an all of an eternity and so it was really fun those four years between the two um to take what i learned in 2012 um and kind of mold it into my own craft and continue to watch other people um and other you know other athletes and learn from them um, so I would say that was my biggest takeaway in 2012 was I would just walk around like with huge eyes the entire time, um, learned a ton from Kathleen Hersey, obviously she was the other trainer butterfly. Um, I remember she took me aside and was like, you're going to feel this way at this point, this way at this point, this way at this point, and then this way when it's all over. And it was just some of the most helpful advice I probably ever received. Um, as far as just an emotional roller coaster that you go through <laughs> in that month leading up to the Olympic Games after you've made the team and then by the time you finish swimming. And so it was just really nice. And before 2012, um, you know, we wanted to wear it. She got us these crazy American flag socks to wear because she, you know, was really focused on like, we're, we do this because it's fun. You know, we want to have fun doing this. It's so much more than just about like swimming fast and um, just so nervous and so much pressure put on you you know we just wanted to go out there and have fun and so that's what we kind of decided to like as a as a girls team in 2012 and so Kathleen bought her and I these like crazy knee hide socks that we wore up to the blocks and it was just a, it was really fun like our bond together and um she still was definitely somebody I looked up to and then all of a sudden was swimming next to um so that was a fun experience as well did you have any expectations in 2012 of of anything at the meet um, to not grow up in the ready room, honestly, that is the most nervous I'll probably ever be in my entire life. Um, I was, I remember just like my feet could not sit on the ground. They were, I was, they were just shaking so bad. And people asked me like, weren't you nervous on your wedding day? And I was like, not at all. Nothing beats 2012 <laughs> Olympic final. Nothing. Um, and so, yeah, so it was just a really fun experience for me. I didn't have too many high expectations. I just really wanted to just take it and and ride the journey and learn as much as I could because I knew at that point I was going to swim four more years um and so I just tried to, to soak it all in okay so you go from 2012 and you know success I mean obviously you make an Olympic final at your first Olympic Games it's success you know a lot of swimmers you know tend to after Olympic Games kind of have that that Olympic rest and you now have to go right back into school because you have to compete again as a member of the Aggies, what was that transition like? Yeah, um, it was tough. I will not lie. My um, junior year was rough, especially, you know, that first semester. I ate way too many donuts and, and really just, I mean, it's hard. It's something that you, people call, people talk about like an Olympic lull and you, you want something and you dream about something every waking moment just about for at least four years you know and then all of a sudden with the snap of your fingers it's over and so it's really hard to figure out what do I do next you know yes I knew I needed to swim but it was like you know this this just peak and then it was gone and and just so fast that's what I don't think people realize is is how quickly it just fades and all those feelings fade um and so for me it was a really hard transition it was definitely something that um started doing some counseling, some self-searching, you know, spending some time finding some other things within the university that I enjoyed just to give me a little bit more perspective on life um, outside of swimming. So I got involved in, in a couple organizations on campus. Um, and so for me, that was really what helped me in the transition because it was not, it was not easy at all. Um, you know, and then I went on junior year to, to win my first national championships and national championship in the Turner Butterfly. So it was, you know, definitely that at first, that first bit was quite rocky. Um, but I think like with the help of Steve, I mean, poor guy saw me cry so many times in his office, probably more my junior year than any other year. <laughs> well, um, but yeah. So a lot of success your junior year. 2014, your senior year, again, successful. Um, after, after college, you went out east. What, what, made, what made you decide that you needed to have a different change of scenery? 
Yeah. I mean, I love a Stephen T and I wish Tamika and I wish I could have like bottled them up and took me with them. But I just felt like me as a person, I needed to continue to grow. And I just didn't feel like I could do that in college station. You know, I've always had this safety net of my family being so close and, and that was my safe haven. You know, college station was like home, home base for me. And I just felt like to be who I wanted to become as an athlete, I had to take a risk. And that was the risk that I felt that I needed to take. I needed to join a pro team where everybody was on the same schedule. And, you know, this was everybody's eggs were in one basket. And that's kind of the intensity that I felt like I needed. Um, you know, I also just felt like I needed to let the college team be a college team. Um, and I just wanted, you know, something something a little bit different. Um, and I definitely got different with, with David Marsh. Um, his training is, is a lot different than Steve's. Um, but I think it was what I needed at, at the time. Um, I just needed to, to switch it up and, and think about things different and, and not, you know, just chase the black line. And like I said before, just continue to watch other people and learn from other people. Um, I had the absolute pleasure of living with Katie Miley for almost two years, I guess like a little 20 months or so. Um, and she is such a special person, one of my all-time favorite, favorite human beings. And so it was so fun because we completed we competed in two completely different events, but I think we learned so much from each other. Um, you know, she studies swimming, like she studies law now. I mean, she is so smart. And I would watch her just like continuously watch video or feedback or, you know, she could just break down her stroke to the smallest details where I would be like, just turn your head and breathe. You know, Katie had it down to like <laughs> mathematic science. And so it was just so cool to, to also live with her, but, you know, train with, train with other people that looked at something different. I mean, Ryan, one of the, Ryan and Tyler, you know, two of the hardest trainers, you know, within the sport at the time, probably ever. Um, so to get to train with, with both of them, and I feel like Ryan knows no pain. I feel like he's, maybe as he's gotten older, but especially at the beginning, he just would do these crazy sets and I would be like, aren't you tired? He's like, well, I mean, whatever. Um, you know, and then, and then Tyler obviously being the distance host that he is, you know, it was nice to, to train with him. And I did lots of training with Percy Coventry who had already been to four Olympic games. And so she was just, and she's also a really, really close friend now. And, um, it was cool to just learn from her and see her point of view of the sport and how it's evolved and, and all those types of things. So I think Charlotte was exactly what I needed when I needed it. And so that's why I decided to make the move. What is the big difference that you saw in yourself from being, I don't want to use the term amateur, but an amateur athlete in college versus a pro? Yeah, it was a huge difference. So that's the biggest thing with David is he believes that it's your sport. Um, it's your practice. It's, it's, it's yours, you know, you're a professional, you know what you need every day. So yes, he had practices and things like that. But if I was like, Hey, I'm just not feeling butterfly today. I think I need to do a tuner backstroke set. As long as it was something that I, he felt as well that it would benefit me. Um, you know, he was like, yeah, whatever you need, it's, it's, it's your practice. Um, where is it like in a college team, it's all for one, you know, you just don't get as many, you know, I think I need this today, or I think I need that. So, um, that's the biggest thing with David. I would also say he very much looked at it like it was our job. Um, I didn't have anything else to do. Swimming was, like I said, everybody's, all their eggs were in one basket. Um, and so, you know, we always had a start time to practice, but we never had an end time. And so some days practice would be 25 minutes long. It would be like a Wednesday recovery and I would do some breaststroke and hop out. And then Saturdays might be five hours at the lake and you would have no idea what the end time was. And so for me, that really just challenged me to not – view practice or view working out or whatever I'm doing as like, just get through it. Camille, just like, you know, you can do anything for two hours, just get through it. It really challenged me to look at it and say, how can I do this set the absolute best that I can? What is this set going to do to make me a better athlete, you know, and a better, a better swimmer? Um, and so that's something that I really enjoy hated at the time, um, you know, but, but in retrospect, like really, um, it benefited me a lot. I think it definitely put me in a better head position um, just in my regular life now. You know, you can't go through life saying I can do anything for two hours. You know, you, you have to always evolve and challenge yourself and grow. Um, and so that's definitely something that, that I did with David. It was a lot more, you know, um, I swam because I wanted to be there. It wasn't because wasn't of the team. Did you consider yourself one of the leaders of the team? 
Um, I think at times, I think at certain times, I definitely step back and learned from others for sure. Um, but I definitely think at times I, I probably was. Mm -hmm. um, we had Kathleen Baker on two weeks ago, and we talked about that team at the time and her being a high school uh, athlete or a younger athlete working with you guys. And one of the things she told us was most of what she had learned about leadership was from you in those years at uh, – at Team Elite. So um, you say you stood back some of the time. Do you think that by standing back sometimes that was a different way of leading and letting others yeah, come to the forefront? Is. Yeah, for sure. I think it is. I think, um, you know, I was a, also a captain at AM for two years, and I think I learned a whole lot in that role. Um, when you're a leader of 40 girls who all have different opinions, you learn a lot. You learn when to step back and when to just listen, and then you learn when to step up and say, no, that's not how this is going to go. Um, and so I think that taught me a lot. Even now in my, in my business today, I think, I think it taught me a lot. You know, I mostly employ high school and college age girls. I, you know, I have a few males on my staff, which is, which is fun. They mix it up, but, um, you know, mostly I do employ, I do employ females. And, and so it's fun for me for this next generation to model for them and lead them and just show them, you know, those, those lessons I learned, um, you know, at sometimes it's good to step back and, and listen to others. And then other times, you know, it's time to allow your voice to be heard. And so it's a, it's a cool dynamic that I think I, I learned early on and then, you know, still use it in my business today. So you talked about in 2012, you knew you were going to go four more years. Um, you talked at the beginning of those, you guys had jumped on before we started the talk, you were telling us about how your, your parents packed up your truck before trials. Um, and brought all your stuff back down to Houston. So at what point did you know 2016 was going to be it for you? Yeah, that's a great question. I um, knew I wasn't going to stay in Charlotte. Um, I was getting married. My husband has an amazing job here in Houston. So I knew if I was going to continue swimming, um, it was going to be here in Houston. There's lots of awesome pool space. I now had the um, experience and the maturity, I think, within the sport to know what I needed to do. I don't need I mean, yes, I would, I would have still joined a team here. I would still have swam. It probably would have been more, you know, with high school kids um, or, you know, something along those lines. But I knew what I needed, whereas in 2000, um, you know, 2012 or even before 2016, I, I didn't know that just yet. And so after 2016, um, the move to Houston, I just, I knew that's what I was going to do. Um, my husband and I, we got engaged in December of 2013. No, we met in 2013, got engaged December of 2014. Um, and so he commuted up to Charlotte for 18 months, pretty much, um, to see me because I wasn't able to, you know, travel or leave or whatever. Right. Um, and that was such a huge sacrifice for him, um, obviously. And so um, I just knew that I wanted, I wanted to be back home and, and be here in Houston with him um, and just start our lives together down here. And so I um, actually deferred my graduation at AM um, because my student teaching, um, which is where I would go into the classroom all day, every day, just did not fit into my training schedule and I just never could make it work. And so we de delayed that. And so I came back and that's why I started school the day after I got back from Rio. Um, we had teacher in service that week. And so I did that and then I graduated, um, finished that. Um, it's, it's like an internship. So I finished that um, in December of 2016. Um, and so at that point I still really, you know, hadn't made up my mind. Obviously being fourth was not where I wanted to be in Rio. I was like, I don't want to be done swimming. I don't want to be done. And of course my dad's like, you don't have to be done. Swim forever, swim forever. <laughs> you know, all the emotions and stuff. Like I said, it just, it ends like that. And, um, but I think once I stepped back and I just kind of realized I need to let the next, you know, the next swimmer do, do what she needs to do within the tuner butterfly. And, and I just needed, I was ready for the next step in my life. And so, um, so that's why I decided my dad is a teacher. We have so many members of our family that teach. And so that's why I, you know, started teaching. Um, I did like fifth and sixth grade, uh, language arts, reading, stuff like that. So, um, it was really fun for me. Um, but the swim schools is my absolute dream job. I always felt like when I was teaching, I was like, did I make the right decision? Like, should I have swam four more years? Is it too late to make a comeback? You know, like all those, you know, not regrets, but, but you just second guess yourself. And the minute I bought the swim schools, it was like all gone. I was like, this is where I'm supposed to be. And so it's just, it's been such a cool, I guess, journey to get to where I am 
Okay. Well, I only have a couple more questions, but these are uh, we'll call them humdingers. Um, so this 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 question for those of you who don't know where I'm going with this, it has a happy ending, I promise. So at trials, you yeah. were you were obviously the center of attention for uh, you make the Olympic team, and immediately you are disqualified. Yep. Um, now that disqualification is overturned, and you make the team, and it was you know. Thank goodness, you know, we got this right. So yeah. I don't want to go to that. But what is that like as someone, you know, you hear from people of what it was like to be third or yeah. what it was like to be seventh. What's it like to make the team and find <laughs> out, no, I didn't. And then, again, your emotions of, oh, yeah, I did. Yeah. Uh, what's, what's that like? Exactly. Um, it went like this. It was a giant roller coaster. Um, so obviously like going in, I didn't even fully taper for trials in 2016. Um, I felt like pretty confident. And honestly, I'm one of those people that, that swim pretty well when I train through a taper. Um, obviously being on the more distant side, I don't taper a ton to begin with. Um, but obviously being, and then getting DQ'd, I remember getting out of the pool and then, you know, you go through the mix zone. It's like an area with cameras and stuff um, that ask you questions and stuff. So I remember I'm waiting for NBC or whoever it was. Um, and I'm just sitting there waiting, 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 like the results haven't been finalized, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden the lady goes, and how does it feel to get disqualified? And I was like, what? And I look up and there was like a giant DQ next to my name. Um, and I'm just so glad I, I kept it together. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, luckily, you know, we have like the, the capabilities now at that level within our sport to review. Um, there's underwater footage. And so I was able to review and they were able to, you know, revoke the call. Um, but it was, it was probably the longest eight minutes of not only my life, but my poor mother's life. <laughs> Um, bless her heart. She will never let me forget it. Like on my deathbed, she'll be like, don't forget. Um, I know. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was tough. I remember I had to go down there and watch the video with the official that made the call and my coach and my dad. And I had to sit there and say, did I do it or not? And it was so, I remember being like, I can't watch this. I can't watch this. And I had to, and I just said, Camille, you do. If you did it, you have to know. And if you didn't do it, you have to know because you have to feel confident in the decision that we, that they've made. And so I just put my big girl panties on and I watched it <laughs> and, um, you know, obviously it was overturned. I went and warmed down, but you know, the roller coaster of emotion, just super nerve wracking. And I, um, warmed down, ate lunch, you know, tried to go back, take a nap. I couldn't fall asleep. Um, and I talk a lot about like the importance of your circle in, in sport and just in life in general, but that's what I did a lot of, of developing is who are those people that, that knew me and knew my heart and knew what I needed, um, throughout my journey within the sport. And, um, one of them being Allison Schmidt and I did lots of training with her my last 18 months, I'd go out to Arizona and train with her and Bob Bowman and Michael and then and Chase and all those guys and then come back to Charlotte. And I just really enjoyed Bob's training style and um, mixed it up. And so I got to know Allison and I have known each other since 2006. Um, our first junior team or my first junior team was she was on it and we just like clicked. Um, and so she during that time, she texted me and said, what room are you in? She knew we were in the same hotel. And so she, I, she came over to my room and she said, um, Camille, like, I know this is going to be really hard to hear, but you need to have a one last good cry. You need to go take a hot shower and you need to get over it because I'm not making, I'm not getting on this Olympic team without you. And I was like, you're right. You're right. That's exactly what I needed to hear. And so that's what I did. I ended up like not being able to really take much of a nap and my semis final was a little rough. Um, but I was so proud of myself and the way that I handled it and how I was able to kind of obviously overcome that, <laughs> the craziness of those, of those, you know, eight minutes or so. Um, but it was again, something that really was very eye opening for me is, is Allison was who I needed in that moment and she knew it, you know what I mean? And so it was just a cool, a cool experience. I mean, I wouldn't wish it upon my worst enemy, but you know. <laughs> how, how was coach Marsh during that experience? Um, he was, actually like more calm than I would expect. Mm -hmm. um, I think he knew because usually I am like the more calm one. And I think when he saw that I wasn't calm, he knew that he needed to be calm. I did a lot of training um, with Bob Grosseff as well. He was also with Team Elite and um, he did more of the distance side of stuff. So um, 
Bob was in there too. And, and Bob is like my man. He's like, and so that I, I swam for Bob. I love Bob. I yeah. swam for him as, when yes. I was younger. Yeah. Yeah. So you get it. Like, yes. Bob is just, he's like, I still will text him from time to time. You know, he's just, he's, he's kind of like Steve in that way that I learned so much about the person that I wanted to become more than I learned about the athlete that I was. And, and so that was definitely like Bob for me. So I think it was probably really hard for Bob. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, my last question, then we'll turn it over to these kiddos. Uh, that Rio team, that, that team USA, what was that like? Obviously, I mean, it was, uh, I mean, dominant is, is, uh, is a good word, but uh, even more just, I mean, inspirational with the, the way, you know, some of the events that happened, you know, people like Anthony Irvin, people like Michael's last Olympics, um, you know, Katie Ledecky. I mean, what was that, that team like? And what was it like being one of the leaders of that team? Yeah, it was um, such a cool experience. Um, so I was voted as a captain for the 2016 Olympic team and, um, so was Allison Schmidt and Elizabeth Beisel, and the three of us are just kind of like the three musketeers, um, especially those four years between the games. And um, I remember they were putting our rooming lists together, and we were like, they usually get, it's big on the women's team, you only get one roommate, because they know if they put four girls in a room together, like, nobody will ever sleep. Always. So, yeah, always. And so, <laughs> well, there was like three of us. So, uh, it, you know, one man was going to be out. So that wasn't an option. So we told them the only way we were going to get on the plane and go to training camp is if they could promise us that the three of us could be in a room together. And Lindsay Mantenko was like, girls, it's not happening. Well, they ended up getting us like adjoining rooms with a door between. And it was so much fun. <laughs> it was so much fun. Um, it was like a giant slumber party every night with them too. And it was just such a cool experience. I remember in 2012, like my memory that sticks out the most is Ryan Lochte's gold medal in the 400 I am like watching the flag raise and get to sing the national anthem with for that, for that swim. And then I think in, you know, in Rio, there was just so many memories that stick out for me. And I don't know if it's because I, I, you know, I just appreciated it a little bit more in Rio. I had been through it already. Um, but, you know, I mean, like Simone Swim, she's from Houston and I've grown up with her. So like, that was amazing, you know, and watching Katie and Baker medal was so cool. Um, you know, and then obviously just getting to, to, to just watch Michael's, you know, Michael's last swim and take part of history there was just such a cool experience. Um, I mean, Matthew McConaughey watched finals with us one night. It was just like <laughs> every day was something different. Um, it was just so fun and um, such a, it's, it's definitely a team that I don't think will ever be able to be um, replicated. Okay. Well, I'm going to turn over some questions here. We'll ask them from the chat. Well, this is a, this might, you may have just answered this one, maybe not. Uh, from Lauren, anyone that you met at Rio that really starstruck you and why was it um, Matthew McConaughey? I, well, maybe Matthew, yeah. Uh, definitely, it was more in, in London. Um, the dream team doesn't, the basketball team doesn't stay in the village because they wouldn't be able to walk anywhere. It's kind of like Michael has a hard time like getting through different parts of the village, especially the dining hall. The dream team would never make it anywhere and there's just not enough bodyguards for all of them. And so they stay at a hotel away or, you know, closer to the basketball arena or wherever. And so in 2012, they came obviously to like meet Michael and, um, and some of the others. And I think that was like one of the coolest things. I was just like, oh my gosh. And my husband still like, doesn't believe me. I'm like, I have pictures to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tony wants to know how important goal setting was with your training. Huge. Um, even still today, I talk like short-term and long-term goals. So short-term goals, um, you know, both obviously equally as important short-term being those things that you work on every day, day in and day out that make the long-term goals happen. And it's still something that I do within my business. You know, it's still, I have my location managers and my employees, right? Long-term and short-term goals. And I just think that it's so important. I wasn't somebody that could shout their goals from the rooftop. Um, you know, I, I kept them, you know, on my bathroom mirror, you know, things like that. Um, where like Elizabeth would ride them on her, Liza would ride them on her kickboard, you know? Um, I think it like depends on the person that you are. Um, but I think goal setting and writing things down, there's so much power in it when you just leave it up here, when things get hard and when life kind of gets difficult or you go through a rut or a plateau within the sport, um, you tend to forget what those things are. So when you can write down goals, um, things that, you know, you want to do every day and, and things that you want to do long-term, I think is really important. And then I would also add, I think it's really important to write down things that 
when you do them that you're really proud of yourself. Um, in times of self doubt, that's something that I would lean on and lean into. Um, you know, when I had a great set or when I didn't breathe off any of my walls the whole practice, or, you know, I slept nine hours for two consecutive weeks or, you know, whatever. Um, I ate broccoli every night for dinner. Um, you know, those types of things that made me really proud whenever at the end of the season, when I'd be like, did I do enough? Should I have trained this more of this blah, blah, blah. All those like self doubt, self doubting moments or negative self-talk. Um, I would look back at my like positive success list. And I think those three things combined together is so, so important within our sport. Okay, uh, Timur wants to ask, I'm gonna rephrase his question. Um, the impact that your sister had on your swimming. Oh, I mean, just the impact I think she has on my life. Um, growing up, it's just the two of us. We don't have any other siblings. My parents had us and they were like, we're done. Um, and so it was just a really, it's a cool bond that we have um, together. And now obviously being on completely different ends of the sport. I mean, she's coaching and I'm teaching. So it, it's cool to kind of see it all come full circle. How do you relax uh, when you're getting nervous at a meet? What's your what's your move to 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 chill out? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, I call it like my pre-race routine um, or my like pre-race ritual. Um, it's kind of what I do from the minute I walk into the pool deck until my swim happens, or even after my swim. Um, it took a long time to develop what that routine was, um, but I'm somebody I'm not. You might not believe me, but I'm not much of a talker before a big race. Um, where Allison Schmidt needs to talk to a brick wall if, you know, she can't find anyone else, anyone else. So I think you have to kind of figure out what that is for you. But for me, it helped me so much when I would get nervous. I wouldn't have added nervous energy. Should I warm up now? Should I talk to my coach now? Do I eat? Do I put my headphones in? You know, all of that extra stuff. Um, so having that pre-race routine or ritual or whatever, I think can help so much if you're somebody that gets nervous. What was it? Do what? What was the routine? What, what, what was oh, your routine? Um, yeah, I would usually like get to the pool, cup of coffee in hand. Um, I did lots of stuff like on land to get sweaty and stuff before I got in the water. So I would do about 10 or 15 minutes of that um, with my music in. Then I'd get in, do my first warm up that usually was around 2,000, 2,300, something like that. Um, I always did 350s pace for Turner Butterfly. Uh, for a 4 a.m., it looked a little different, but for Turner Butterfly, always 350s pace and a dive. Um, sometimes two dives, just kind of depending. And then I'd go back and hang out, put my, put my music on, um, maybe talk. And then, um, it, it really depends on the meet because some meets, you know, you have to be in a ready room 30 minutes before you actually race. And then other meets, you know, you can just walk straight up to the block. So it kind of depended, but, um, I pretty much like did the same, you know, give or take minutes here or there, the same kind of routine, whether I was swimming a dual meet or the Olympic games finals. Um, I'm somebody that does a lot of warm up right before the race. I like to go to the block sweat. Um, but I also like to be there on time because Elizabeth Beisel does not like Elizabeth, like wants the sirens going off looking for her at a ready room. Like me, I'm like, <laughs> no, no, that gives me so, I'm such like an, I have to be on time kind of person makes me so nervous. So I make sure I got to the ready room early. I was always one of the first ones in there. I got my chair that I wanted, you know, those types of things. See, I, you're like me because when you just said that story about Elizabeth, it actually made me nervous that I'm not in the ready room on time and I haven't swum in 20 years. And so that made me nervous. She, she would like be getting into warm up when they would be like, like, Elizabeth, where's Elizabeth? And she's like, oh, I'm warming up. I'm about to get in. And you're like, no, no, we're about to, gonna parade to the blocks. And she's like, I'll be there. Don't worry, I'll be See, there. That, was, that was her routine. That's what she needed. It worked for her, but it gave me <laughs> mass anxiety. Mass okay. anxiety for her. So um, <laughs> who was your idol growing up? Great question. Misty Hyman, for sure. I remember watching her win gold in 2000 in the Turner Butterfly and just being like, that's really, I was nine years old. So that's the Olympic, my first Olympics I remember um, and actually having memories of. And so I remember being like, this is just so cool. And then she came to one of our like team banquets or in some, or LSE maybe and talked. And I remember just like getting to meet her and always looking up to her. And then, um, really cool between 2012 and 2016 I went out to she was coaching at Arizona so I did I actually stayed with her a couple of times I got to do some private lessons and training with her and stuff like that and so it was just really cool to see like how much time and energy she put into like the future of this sport and put into me and so she will always have a really special place in my heart since I was nine yeah that's very nice um Alexis can Alexis ask you a question Jeff can you unmute Alexis so she can ask a question 
Go ahead, Alexis. No, maybe. Alexis, we can't hear you if you're there. Nope, we may have lost her. Oh, that's too bad. I just lost one. I feel bad. Um, what is, Tony wants to know what the biggest challenge you've ever faced in. Um, the biggest challenge I think within the sport is probably the decision to move to Charlotte, that or the DQ probably between those two. Um, a fun fact, my goggles also broke right before the Olympic final in Rio. So, um, you know, and then I almost didn't make the final in Rio. I was eighth or, you know, whatever. I was an outside lane. So between the DQ, not almost not making the final and my goggles breaking for the final, it just like led me straight into retirement. That's what I tell everybody. Um, but I would probably say the most, the most challenging thing was probably the decision to move to Charlotte or the DQ, just how much those two things within, you know, those events really made me grow even as a person outside of the sport. Okay. What's your go-to meal? Oh my goodness. My go-to meal. Um, I, we do a lot of tacos around here. Um, like I'm actually making them for dinner tonight. Um, but I'm also like a cookie fiend and wedding cake is my favorite food of all time. Like wedding cake. There's just something that makes it like so much better to know it's wedding cake. I don't know. Wedding cake's my favorite food. I was going to ask what your best food vice was, but I'm guessing it's wedding cake after hearing about your love for wedding cake. Or um, cookies. We have this new place called Cookie Crumble. They're like bigger than your head cookies. Um, and they're terrible for you, but the Corona 15 has definitely happened at this house with the amount of times we've ordered. Yeah, I blocked you out when you said it's as big as your head. That's all I needed to hear. I don't even care how bad it is for me. I'm fine now. <laughs> they change um, every week. There's six new cookies every week. So they keep drawing you back in. It's like, what are you supposed to do with that? You need to go there every week and try a different cookie. I don't, uh, there's, there's no other answer besides that one. I need to uh, run to get the cookies. I need to run there and run home. That's what needs well, to happen. Then you feel better about yourself after eating the cookies. I, I don't see a problem with that either. Uh, um, what, uh, let me see if I got a couple more here. Uh, what exercises would you recommend to athletes for them to be focusing on during quarantine? I'm yeah. not sure how much you know about us. We're, we're still not in the water. So yeah. our athletes are still doing things on land and trying to find ways to stay active. Yeah, I would definitely say, you know, anything as uh, on land is like push up, sit ups, you know, body weight stuff, just as long as you're doing it correctly and you're, you know, not going to hurt yourself. Um, I think we'll help with time. Anything to, you know, get your heart rate up for 30 minutes a day, I think is so important, whether it's, you know, jumping jacks or playing a game of basketball or, you know, going on a long walk with your family, you know, things like that, just to keep your body active and moving. Um, that's what I did a lot of. Um, especially my last 18 months or so, um, you know, my body was getting older and changing and I had back issues and shoulder issues and I couldn't spend as much time necessarily just pounding away at the yardage. So that's actually why I did a lot of like getting sweaty before warm up or getting sweaty before, you know, practice um, so that I could spend a little bit less time heating my body up, more time just feeling the stroke. Um, and so I think if you guys can figure out some of those ways, um, you know, to kind of do that kind of stuff on land right now. I think it's really important. I also think right now the goal setting is really, really important. Um, start writing some of those things down now while you have time. I think now is such a great time to do those types of things. Okay, so I only have a couple questions left. It's kind of like my lightning round of questions. It's just, it's firing off really fast. Um, true or false, you're a big Disney fan. True. What is the, the hidden gem of Disney movie that everyone has to watch? Oh my gosh, hidden gem. I don't know. Is there a Disney movie that you just love? Oh, that you, oh, oh, like, I what is the hidden gem? One, no, say. no, no. What is the hidden gem that, like, oh. you're a Disney fan, you got to see this? Yes. Um, Mulan is, like, my all time favorite. Whenever I used to study in college, I would put on, let's get down to business. And I would just be like, yeah. Um, when I would study in college. So that was, like, my, my go to pump up. Um, so Mulan is definitely my favorite, but I'm also a huge Hercules fan. Like, oh, so good. So good. Achilles. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, you're in Texas. Tacos or barbecue? Oh, tacos for sure. What kind of taco? We do. Uh, I do a lot of chicken because I don't eat a lot of beef in general. I didn't. My dad's a vegetarian, so I didn't grow up eating a lot of beef. So we do a lot of chicken. But I, the amount of chips and queso and salsa that we consume, my husband and I is is a problem. We need. Okay. To Star Wars or Marvel? 
oh, um, my husband would kill me if I didn't say Star Wars. He's a big, he's a big Star Wars. So okay. he's very smart. He's very, very smart. Uh, so, so we're from Chicago. We've been talking about food. I've had to ask, you know, obviously food. Uh, pizza. Are you a big pizza person? Yes. Deep yes. dish, thin. Um, we don't have a lot of good deep dish places down here. I have had it when I've been up and visited, and it's so good. But we need like better places down here to get. Okay, okay, all right. So your cookie, your cookie fan. What is the go-to cookie? Like, what is? Um, they have this. Um, it's cinnamon Nutella one that they've had before, so that was legit. Um, last week they had a chocolate molten lava cake, and it was like a. It was like a, mol a molten lava cake, but in like a cookie, so it was kind of like harder on the outside, but there was like fudge on the inside. It was, oh my gosh, it was so good. Um, okay. But if I'm making them at home, I do lots of, um, my husband loves like oatmeal chocolate chip or white oatmeal white chocolate chip cookies with ice cream in the middle, like the little sandwiches. That's like, if for his birthday, that's like what his request is, so. Okay, so you have the ability to eliminate any swim event from, from our program. Every, any swim event, you can pick one, it's gone. Nobody ever has to do it again. What's the event you would get rid of? Oh, good question. Um, oh my gosh, probably the fifty free because I think it's boring. I'm like, it's just it's only, over too fast. It's only thirty seconds. Then what's the point of swimming it, right? Yeah, it's like I I used to watch Colin like get ready for a fifty free or do visualization for his fifty free at practice, and he would leave like like just exhausted. And I'm like, all you did is sit on the blocks for two hours and just look at a black line. Like I don't understand, but takes a special person with some of the 50 free. So the 50 free goes away. All right. Well, I don't have any other questions. I appreciate you taking your time tonight to, to talk with us. Thank you very much. I wish you the best of luck in your reopening of your swim schools. You, you lucky, you lucky dog, you that gets to get in the pool. Um, nothing but the best. Take care and uh, good luck. Thank you guys so much. It was so nice to meet you guys. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.